So real quick before we actually head into the facility proper. Yeah, Tataro is now dancing here. And singing. And she's built up uh, quite a crowd here. I think she's got a couple other lines, so I'm just going to walk away a little bit. To kind of reset her dialogue, because that was not what she said when I first came in here. Do I have to walk out the door entirely? Okay, fine. Fine, 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 fine. Yeah, this was also one I missed. Okay, shut the door. Yeah, hold on about that. Hold on. Oh, she's not gonna say it now. Uh, but the line I caught earlier, she she said she learned from directly from the songstress old da, which is Minfilia's adopted mom. Oh, now she's looking around. Oh, that's so cute. So yeah, I told you guys she does stuff. So welcome to the Aetherochemical Research Facility, where we're going to witness a bunch of, well, oligon experiments and crap. And this place is still functioning. Now what's really crappy about this place, even though it's understandable, is this place drops no gear. There's no items in here whatsoever to be found, which is kind of crappy. Um, but at least in exchange, it drops more tombstones as a result of this. Uh, um, you might want to be actually in defiance. Because I'm going to spam the shit out of holy here. Oh, he's not going to do the best of pull? Okay. All right, fine, 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 fine. Uh, most tanks actually will pull up directly to the wall, uh, in the first gate. And in which case, because of these guys, uh, you guys want to, uh, tanks, uh, note to self, uh, pop your cooldowns here, because these hittings, as you can see, hit like a motherfucking truck. The first giant pull actually is the hardest hitting pull in this entire dungeon. So, what are we going to talk about? What are we going to talk about? Uh, there's a lot of things I need to talk about here. So, where am I going to start? Uh, let's start, actually, with Midgard Somer himself, I guess. Just, just briefly. I know I kind of went on about him very briefly at the end of the last episode. But more, actually, what I want to go on is his appearance as a mount. And that he's just suddenly grown. Now, I'm not going to bother to try to explain away the... Uh, the actual mechanism by the way, by how that happens, he's fucking Dragon God, okay? Automatically excused by there. More my point, and that what kind of concerned me, at least when I first did this, we knew we were going to get a Dragon Mount somewhere along our journey. It's the figurine that came in the, in the, um, the Collector's Edition package, after all. And people accurately, I might add, uh, correctly guessed that the, this mount was going to end up being Midgard Solmar based on some of the physiology, you know, uh, traits and whatever. So, well, I'm not going to knock them for that, and I'm not going to say that, like, I was, like, complete in disbelief, being like, no, no, you guys are too into reading that. But I thought that was kind of too easy. And after we learned partway through the story that, um, that the pe pe people can actually become dragons, uh, if they've uh, both partaken in Dragon's Blood and have Ratatoska's legacy, um, will become dragons themselves. Now, now we know that the people who end up doing that are actually very specific kinds of dragons. But at the time of this release, we did not know that. We did not have that information yet. So I was kind of guessing and actually had kind of hoped that our dragon mount was not going to be Midgard Somer and that they were going to plot twist it and do it another way and that it was gonna actually gonna be a Stinian. You know, something happened to him, he would be end up forced to drink the dragon's blood or whatever, and he would end up being the Mao and being equally pissed off at this, you know, would be willing to let us ride and be like, yeah, fuck those fuckers, you know, I'm gonna make the most of this kind of thing. 
And I was a bit, I understand obviously why they didn't go that route, but I was a bit disappointed that the obvious guess that Midgard Somer was the mount um, actually ended up being true. It kind of made it a little bit more anticlimactic in the end, I guess, especially for the reasons I said in the last episode. It doesn't give him any more depth of character, and I think he was robbed of it as a result. Um, maybe that was kind of their intention, that he is supposed to be, you know, this more ethereal force rather than an actual character. But it still kind of annoyed and frustrated me a bit, especially after the whole issue with Tiamat, where they had opportunities to give him a bunch of uh, uh, actual character development in some way, shape, or form, and they didn't. On top of that, I was a bit disappointed in that to, un to re-unlock our final crystal, it happens by talking and listening to Tiamat, all right? But we only did that, well, partially because she was right there, but also, ah, oh, crap. Because he deliberately actually told us to do that. Like, I thought the point of us, you know, him getting to trust us was that he was testing us and that he would not aid us. And all of a sudden we do exactly what he tells us to do, get our crystal back, and he's like, oh, yeah, okay, you're worthy. Okay. I mean, granted, obviously, the, all the other stuff we did before that, you know, would count toward that as well. But it, that being the last one, it, it just never quite sat well with me as a result of it. And on top of, on top of all that, I know I don't shut up about these, these, these stupid things, is that he actually makes himself appear before Tiamat. Now, if she actually senses his presence before he actually, you know, poofs himself out of the, you know, straight out of the Aether or whatever, is not really known, but obviously she recognizes him, all right? Even though he obviously looks completely different and he's the size of a little puppy or a kitty now. Obviously he's got some sort of ethereal signature that's, you know, unique to him and that his children can sense it. Why aren't either Nidhogg nor Hrisvilgar sensing this? Or if they do, why not mention it? Like, that's another thing that kind of just pissed me off about how he was just, just absolutely robbed of any potential development, is that you have all these opportunities where him showing up or being exposited upon or being mentioned could have been important and could have added a lot of depth, not only to his character, to Hrisvogar's character, to Nidhogg's character, and also to the plot. And also, well, obviously, Izel knows he's with us. What about Astinian? I would really like to have known Astinian's take on Holy shit, the fucking father of dragons is following you. I will crush you underfoot. Like, it, it, it really would have been nice to, 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 to get his sort of opinion and see if actually that reflected on, you know, his willingness to help us or not. Savages. So, enough about Megar Somer. Um, let's switch over to Izel. Now, a lot of what we learn um, about what happens there it happens, obviously, in one of the anniversary tales later on. Uh, that was released several months after the fact. And it does expose it, indeed, that yes, she does kind of... Uh, my Medica guys, thank you. She does uh, make up with Hreisvogar, and they, 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 they do kind of make their peace with one another, which I think is really sweet. And it's almost sad, even though I kind of understand it, uh, that they don't expose it, or expose it on it in the main scenario quest itself, that I, I do find it sweet that they, they, they do amend their differences, even though she... I'm on, I'm on her side in the end with calling Hreisvogar out on this crap and all that, but... At the same time, I can kind of understand him being a little bit angry that she had believed herself to be the reincarnation of his dead lover. Especially how much that stings, considering all that happened both before and after. But it is revealed that in, in said tale, um, that what she seeks is not forgiveness, but atonement for all she's done. 
So I found that really nice and a really nice uh, final arc to her character. And though I'm quite upset that she kind of died, even though a lot of the reason is they killed my ship, fuck you, that's the second time you've done that to me, game. On the other hand, I kind of understand why they did so. Because frankly, at that point, her character really didn't have anywhere else to go. Like, she, she, she by that very moment in making that kind of sacrifice, she pretty much completed, would you stop standing in that? She completed, you know, her character arc and she'd come full circle and, you know, she learned to amend for her mistakes and, and work to actually make up for it rather than excuse it, even if she did spend most of the first act of the game trying to excuse her actions. I'm really glad that in the end, you know, she does turn toward atonement rather than seeking actual forgiveness. So, um, even though I hated her, obviously, coming into Heaven's Ward, I really I came to like her and enjoy her by the end. And it's one of the probably, um, I wouldn't say the best because I'm not really familiar with lots of media, um, you know, like games, anime, you know, cartoons or whatever. Because once I find something I like, I tend to stick with that one thing for quite a while. So I don't have a very broad horizon of, you know, a vast majority of character development thing and in in all sorts of media and whatnot. But but at least as far as I'm concerned, for what I have personally seen, uh, her redemption arc was actually even if I was kind of pissed off at her through most of the first arc, Heaven's Ward, I think her redemption arc was was in the end handled very well. Uh, there could have been a little bit of things that were handled a little, could have been handled a little better and a little bit differently. But at least I, I, I very much liked the, the dynamic and the bickering she had going on with Astinian at the very least. And kind of showing, uh, no, I need my thing off, thank you. That even though we were technically temporarily on the same side and had the same goal, you're not all just going to suddenly become get along and become best friends. Now, obviously, a lot of their bit their their their, their bickering was was very petty and annoying, and they both came off as petulant children. But at the same time, as adults, I actually find that kind of endearing in sort of way. I mean, it's half of why I ship it because I think it's fucking hilarious. But like, for once, I'm glad that you know adults aren't acting like proper adults that you know adults can you know regress back and 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 just start acting like petty just 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 whiny little children who aren't going to get their way and whatever and being so stuck in their own ways that they're not going to actually listen to somebody else until they're actually actively forced to do so so i really kind of enjoy that like they didn't even try to they i mean they they were they were peaceful enough to each other that they didn't resort to actual physical fighting. But at the same time, I'm really grateful that they they did not just, you know, the writers did not just make it a, oh, okay, we're temporarily on the same side, everyone's gonna get along. No, everyone's not gonna fucking get along. They weren't even trying. Uh, you might want to get this crap off me. Did I mention I kind of hate this place? Actually, no, I really don't. There are, there are worse dungeons in the game, but if it's not handled properly, you can be in for a world of hurt. Specifically, like, right here. Um, just because there's so many mobs going on and being summoned. And, a uh, fun fact about here. I, I have another confession of laid dumb here where I didn't realize till six months ago what the, what the meaning of the, the these these cultured X and all this stuff was now coming from the age where like hipsterism is like a big joke and things like that and living in a post 2000s world the fact that it's 2017 already just blows my fucking mind but that's neither here nor there I originally took the word cultured as the other kind of cultured as in kind of snooty upper class and, and that context of culture and not like what they actually mean here and culture is in like a bacteria culture that you grow in a petri dish yeah that's what they meant here and needless to say when I finally figured that out and it all made sense 
boy, did I feel fucking stupid. Oh, like, it all of a sudden just hit me like a brick, and I'm like, oh, okay, this makes a lot more sense now. And all of a sudden, it just became more just creepy at how fucked up the oligons were. Like, some of these, I don't know if you've seen it, um, actually have little dialogue, like um, these biohazards, I think, like when they die. Like, they're, like, screaming in, like, pain and agony and things like that. And it's, it's just 20 shades of just absolutely just fucked up. I mean, the aliens were sick fucks, y'all. I mean, this is a research facility. And, yes, they're, like, just growing these chimeras for their own research purposes. And I hate this bleed because it's on an angle. It, it tends to supersede its hitbox a bit. I'm going to stand and target this chimera. Because he can both do a ram's voice and dragon's voice. Okay, dragon's voice. Okay, I'm in. Alright, got stunned anyway, but we're good. We're good. Yeah, holy shit, what else am I going to talk about? Um, again, a lot of, some of the times I have things planned for this, but a lot of times I'm just completely talking out my ass. Like, I have, like, ideas of, of what kind of thing, what kinds of things I want to address and talk about and, and stuff like that. But a lot of, again, a lot of times it's just me literally just, just spewing pretty much the equivalent of verbal diarrhea. But that was, like, the whole point of, of this, playing, less playing this game anyway, was for me to get all my thoughts and, and discussions out in, in a platform. Even if I'm terrible at doing it verbally and spur of the moment. Uh, a lot of these thoughts have been written down in the past, but since I can't really put a cohesive sentence together uh, in written format, that doesn't really work in much of my favor. So, apologies for the cuts here. Uh, we have another new person in the party, and the tank is just kind of explaining to them what's going on. You guys don't need to see all that. Plus, it gives me a chance to actually take a breath and a sip of water. Hooray! So, one thing I should also mention is, and I know I've talked about this before, but my disappointment about how they don't really exposit on any sort of interpersonal relationship between Alphano and Izel. Because I really think the story could have benefited from it. I kind of understand why, obviously, but considering he was the one who, who figured out what she was trying to do and sicked us on her ass because she was going to, you know, summon a primal. And I'm really glad he, he kind of, especially as early as he did, like I said before, I probably kind of realized that they had a lot in common, and which is why this is I'm disappointed that they really didn't go anywhere with this. Really, truly came to, just like Estinian, but for slightly different reasons, uh, came to make peace with her. To even to the point where she thinks, you know, he thinks she should have, she, she very well could have been one of the members of the Scions of the Seventh Dawn. And it's, and it's probable that she, uh, he, they may very well have sent in a formal invitation to her in some way, shape, or form sometime after all this happened. Because in the end, even though her, her mechanisms were different, in the end, was she really d any much different from, you know, ourselves or Minfilia? And no, she really wasn't. And one of the things I really feel brings this point out that's, Again, not really exposited on, um, for obviously understandable reasons, but it's actually brought up by, uh, Lucia about, you know, we all must fight for our convictions and what we hold dear. And I think that rings very relevant to, obviously, Izel's character, because that's pretty much what she did. Uh, even if she was trapped in her own delusions for a while, at the same time, a lot of it wasn't really... I don't wanna... I hesitate to use the word not her fault, but... She formed her opinions and her plan of action based on what, the, you know, her encounters and what the Echo had shown her. And basically, that's what happens to all of us, uh, whether we realize it or not. Our, us, our personalities, how we, how we view the world, our viewpoints and whatever and everything, are largely shaped by our own experiences and the experiences told to by us to those around us. So I'm not gonna like entirely, even though I was really kind of pissed at her for a while, um, I, I, I kind of do after all of this and knowing the hell she went through and, you know, the feeling that she, how pissed she was at Hrysvagar that, you know, 
not only was she pissed at the whole, that the Holy See had, had been deceiving everybody for years and that, yes, Man and Dragon had been at peace at one time, and therefore it can happen again. I, and I really wish, again, um, the story kind of went into this a little bit more. I'm glad they made up in the end, but they really don't go into just how utterly betrayed she must feel that for everything she had seen in her chance encounter with him and believing for all that time that she was a reincarnation of his dead lover, that he was pretty much just as fault for perpetuating the war as Nidhogg was. And they really don't get into that. And on the one hand, the story might be better off as a result of not doing that because it lets her, her character come to, uh, you know, a head in an arc a lot more quickly rather than her completely regress and just go mad. Although, honestly, that would have been a very, you know, a very much different and, and interesting take on it if they handled it properly. Um, but overall, I, I am still obviously very satisfied in in the arc they gave her, and especially the amount of time they, they, they do it in. They do not squander very much. The, the very little, in comparison to the, the vast narrative of what is Final Fantasy XIV as a whole, uh, they do not squander her. Uh, she does regress at some points, but considering it all comes to a head at the end and in retrospect, es again, especially for the amount of time that she has to actually grow and develop and change and, you know, finish her character arc and whatever, they really did make the best of it, which makes it all the more disappointing that in other regards, other characters don't get that same treatment. I mean, I mean, you're not, you're not going to hit a masterpiece every single freaking time. But considering how well I think they handled it here, it really, again, it really makes me kind of disappointed that in future patches, and in actually past one, other characters don't get that. And it especially point up, uh, disappoints me as I went through with the library itself. A lot of the problem that I have with the Scions of the Seventh Dawn is exactly that. Like, somebody who started out as a fucking villain in less screen time, ends up becoming not only a true friend to multiple of her own enemies, ends up sacrificing herself for the good of the cause, realizing that, yes, you know, R1 is the right one, and she's, she, and she's grateful that even for all she's done, that she's shown the right way, and that she cannot let go of her dream, and ya la 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 la, all that good stuff. We've already seen that in a cutscene. She still gets more development than the people we're supposed to be rooting for from the beginning. And again, it, 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 it genuinely upsets me and makes me angry that for all the screen time that the Scions get, they really don't get that development. And it's one of the reasons why I, I'm still kind of babbling because I forgot what else I was going to discuss here. Why I don't like Gestola all that much because out of all the Scions, um, obviously besides Elfano, but he's already getting his own character development and all that good crap. Her being the voice of dissension at some points, you know, she's the one who's crying, what, you know, from time to time, you know, playing the devil's advocate card and whatnot. For all she does of that, nothing ever comes of it. She's all talk and she's no action. And she would make, like, the perfect counterpoint to the rest of the Scions in that, are we doing the right thing? Is this the right path? Do we have another way? I mean, obviously, in the end, she, she kind of gets, you know, she does kind of agree that... Well, the ends do justify the means to to some extent, and that in the end, what we what we gain, and if we have no better ideas, well, I guess we just might as well, sort of thing. But there's just so much fucking potential there for to to raise this gray morality uh, within, you know, the quote unquote good guys. I mean, they 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 do a fairly good. I mean, they do it like with. They did it with Azel, they did it with uh, Guy's fan Belzar. You know, that sometimes the villains do have a fucking point. I mean, in the end, they, they, they all kind of go to extremes in order to exploit that point. But on the other hand, why is nobody actually actively questioning, and, and this is the important part, acting on the part that, well, are we, are we any different? Now, I honestly don't have enough for an answer to that. I, I honestly really don't. Because in the end, I believe we are doing the right thing because it's the right thing. And, and again, our experiences and our worldview, in-universe as well, um, have shaped who we are. 
and it shapes how we react to the world around us, you know, and our knowledge. Um, obviously, if we're ignorant of certain things, well, unless somebody corrects that ignorance, and, and man, I'm getting packed a lot so damn hard here. And we're kind of left in the dark. Well, it's really nobody's fault. It's just one of those sad things. I mean, we should always be seeking to correct our own ignorances. But if the world around us does not facilitate that, well, that's just, that's just kind of shitty and that's life. I mean, I know that's a horrible excuse, but... It, it is one of the sad facts of life. You can't know something unless you have the ability to actually actively learn about that. The champion of Hydaelyn. Hi. You aren't who we're after? Tell me, why do you despise the primals so? They are the embodiment of mortal will. Of mortal desire. Plainly, you desire a foe to despise. And tis well that you do. For it is from the vortex of ceaseless conflict that Lord Zodiac shall be reborn. Through the joining, the world shall become whole again. Do we need a close up of this crotch? Then all shall be as once it was, as it should ever have remained. Okay, I have no idea what, to, what the hell you two are fucking talking about, but... For the glory of Lord Zodiac. Your meddling ends here and now, a warrior of light. So yeah, Ige Orum, um, I don't believe we've actually had a proper introduction. I mean, I met you for a whole, like, 30 seconds, and you kind of temporarily paralyzed me and took the key from me, but why should I give two fucks about you? Because I honestly don't. But anyway, to, fi to, fi to, uh, to finish off my thought, uh, basically, I really wish there was just there was just more exposition in and a little bit more gray area instead of goody goods for the Scion side. And Yshola is a great avenue for them to explore that, and unfortunately, they don't. So yeah, these are not the Archbishop and his crony. But probably they're nearby because they're the ones who told them uh, partly about the key and have gotten them in here. So hopefully they're... Ah, oh, shit. I did not mean to kind of walk into that, but... Oh, come on. I am lagging so hard right now. I'm getting packet lost like crazy. Mortal scum. Ah, well, fuck you. Can I get this thing off? Thank you. So yeah, once she reaches half, they're end up gonna switch off. Not that it really makes any difference because it's pretty much playing the same game over and over and over again. I'm just gonna sit here and just wait. Usually I DPS hardcore here, but it's late at night and because of the, 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 the server cluster move, I occasionally get packet loss, which really kind of sucks ass. But we'll live, we'll live. So yeah, these Asians have had enough and are meddling. But yeah, to answer your question, Igeorum, the reason why we hate the primals is because, well, their their mere existence is a drain on the world. Okay? We kind of live on this world. Alright? I don't know what your plans in the grand scheme are and all that good shit, but I kind of live here. I kind of work for Heidelin. She's kind of asked me to do this, so yes. And even Midgar Zomar said I was fucking cool, okay? Alright? Alright, Dragon Dad. Dragon Dad thinks I'm worthy. Why the fuck should I give care what you think? Such strength. It defies all reason. Yeah, we've kicked your ass before, La Habrea. Do you not remember this? 
No, I will not be bested by the likes of them. La Habrea, it is time. Very well. Let us show these mortals the true power of the Echo. The power to break down the barriers of existence. Okay. So, is this a euphemism for G-rated ASEAN sex or something? Oh, come on. I had to make a joke about something here. So this is ASEAN Prime, the actual... Okay, he did get protect on him after that. Um, I forgot I recast it after the Black Mage died. Uh, the actual original form of the ASEANs in 1.0, and that's all I know about the ASEANs in 1.0, so we're just going to leave it at that. So yeah, if you've noticed, this is pretty much the only instance in pretty much the entire 3.0 4X series where there is actual cutscenes within... The actual dungeon. Yeah, they learned their lesson from uh, Castor Meridianum or whatever the hell it was called in the Praetorium with lengthy cutscenes. But I don't really mind it much here because they are pretty much significantly shortened and they are plot important. Even if they are extended a bit longer than they should be. So it's pretty much um, mostly the same game here. Just beat the shit out of them. And, and while I'm glad, you know, they're playing the Maker's Ruin here and making this seem like a climactic battle, on the other hand, the Ancians really haven't had a direct hand in the plot up before this point. Like, we know they've been working with the Archbishop and whatever, but nothing was really ever done with it other than that knowledge that they're in cahoots with the Archbishop. And, and even he admitted that to us of his own, of his own volition. But... I don't want to say it's entirely a disappointment because obviously this, um, I'm not going to get into that for now. But this never really sat well with me because even though, yeah, oh, we need to vanquish the Asians, blah, 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 all that good luck with shit. This almost comes out of nowhere. Like, like I said, it's not entirely because... Well, we know they're in cahoots with the Archbishop and that, you know, supposedly the Archbishop and, you know, the Heaven's Ward are here. But... For the, for, for the rest of the story, the Asians haven't actually suffered. Let me try to gather my thoughts here. I know what I want to say, though, just the words aren't coming out. The Asians haven't really played a role as antagonists in the 3.0. Like, they've just kind of sat in the looming in the background. Yes, they're, they're a constant, ever-looming threat. But until this moment, they're not an immediate one. And not only that, they had the fucking chance to kill us when they outright after Bismarck when they stole the key from us. Why not do it then? Clearly that we've meddled too much and they want us gone. So why, why waste the opportunity to do, to do it then and wait until now? That, that's never actually explained. Like, that's literally the last time we've seen them. So it's not like, 
you know, they were ordered to, you know, not fuck with us and keep us alive because as we've seen with Olympus in the past, that, you know, we are tools and we have a role to play and everything like that. But what has changed between Bismarck and now that it's suddenly okay to want to try to kill us? Because there hasn't been anything that's changed. Damn portals, okay. Yeah, what really sucks about these stupid things is that it takes forever to actually get in them. So as you can see what just happened with the black mage there, it seems like you're in when you're really not. Uh, you have to wait until the actual fetters takes place before it will actually count you as being a part of uh, being in there and thus being immune from the debuffs. And no, hello ground will not get you around that. It's one of the few things that won't. Now, with these whole orb things, uh, a lot of people will tell you that you actually need to take someone other than your own. You really don't. You j just, just literally, in other fights where that have similar mechanics to this, you do have to take someone else's orb but your own. But here, it really doesn't matter. It is so easy for the damn healer. They only do like a thousand damage. It is so easy for the healer to keep you alive. So don't even fucking bother actually going out of your way to detonate the orbs, you really don't need to. Just stand here and fucking take it. So have you had enough now, bitches? Have you? Hooray! 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 So, yeah. Yeah. Completely awesome. So what now? What now? Serious? I don't know. I don't know. Because you know there's going to be a cutscene that's going to play when I click on this exit. So we're going to have to do that next time. Because I don't want to make this episode go on even longer. So what awaits us now? Are we going to find the Archbishop and his cronies? Will we actually get to them before they actually unlock the secrets of Alag? And start fucking shit up? I don't know. Whatever happened to the Imperials in this place? I mean, we just kicked regular Van Hydrus' ass. What are they going to do now? I don't know. We'll have to find out next time. Thank you for watching, friends. And I will see you there.